Thank you, Kurt, for a wonderful worship this morning. I'm thankful for that. I'm shaking this morning. Somebody pray for me. I'm just shaking. I'm just nervous. I'm itching. I'm, yeah, please do. We'll do it down here. I'll come halfway. How about that? Some of you guys that are around. Some of these youth here. Yeah. Come on up. Just nervous. Is that all right? Father, we pray for Pastor Jimmy this morning, and we pray, God, a fresh anointing of your spirit to be upon him, that you would maybe not even take away the nerves, but that the anointing of your spirit would just have opportunity to flow through him and minister to each one here today. We give you honor, glory, and praise, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen thank and you. amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. What do you think of when you think of Thanksgiving, guys? What are some things we think of? Blurt them out. We're, we're all family here. We think of turkey. turkey. What else? Family. What else? <laughs> There's my man. How about that? Mashed potatoes with gravy or butter? Let's test that. Butter. <laughs> there you go. Butter. What else? Gratefulness. It's sort of cliche that, that we come into this time of the year and we sort of just are thankful for things. I know we, we have family get-togethers. Um, either the kids come home or we're the kids that go home. That's sort of a, of a tradition. Uh, food. Um, don't forget to set your scales back 15 pounds Wednesday night so that you can be all right on Thursday, right? Football is a big deal in my house. Uh, I enjoy watching football on Thanksgiving. I enjoy going hunting. Usually I go out Thanksgiving evening. These are just things that are just sort of normal for Thanksgiving, right? And we, in, we indulge in our excess and in our abundance. And something that we usually do, depending, how many have the tradition of before we eat, we're going to go around the circle and tell everyone what you are. Who, who does that? Everybody does that, right? It's just, we're so grateful on Thursday, the 25th whatever day it is, 27th this time, Thursday, Thanksgiving Day. We're thankful. Hey, don't judge me. I get up when Becky says, and I go to bed when she says. I don't look at the calendar. <laughs> ah, but what about the rest of our lives? And I know you guys were probably expecting some type of Thanksgiving uh, message this morning, and I'm not sure if I didn't preach out of this passage before but if you will take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 17, if you have a Bible or iPad, whatever you have, and follow along, Luke chapter 17, I am going to read it out of the King James Version this morning. I like reading out of there sometimes, and so turn to Luke 17. I'll also have it on the overhead. What about the rest of our lives? Are we thankful for that? Are we thankful when we are at work? Are we thankful that our children have such tight schedules when it comes to sports and the things that they want to do? Or does it get sort of aggravating sometimes and like, mm, just gets us in the side a little bit? You mean, again, we got to go to volleyball here. We got to go to Taekwondo there. We've got, uh, we'll always make time to hunt, right, Mason? How about church activities? Do we get a little grinded when Awana Wednesday nights come around? We really don't have time, and it sort of eats into our schedule, and we don't quite be as thankful about that. Nobody's guilty here. I know that, but I know other churches deal with that. Do we remember to be thankful, or is it just that one day that everybody across the nation of America is thankful, and so we're thankful with them? And I'll just be honest with you. There are days that I get caught up in forgetting to be thankful. I get caught up in my daily grind, and I, I, I get so caught up in the things that are happening to me, I tend to feel sorry for myself. I tend to pity myself because nobody else does. And the next thing I know, I'm not grateful for a thing I have. Luke chapter 17, verse 11, it says like this. 
one of my favorite passages of Scripture, and I know that I've preached out of it before, but hey, today we're going a different route, hopefully. Hopefully something that God can give you through my words this morning that can bless you. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem. Who went to Jerusalem? Let's figure that out. Who was going? Jesus was going to Jerusalem. He passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Verse 14, and when he saw them, he said to them, unto them, go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back, and with a loud voice, he glorified God. And fell down at his feet, Jesus' feet, giving him thanks, giving Jesus thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Verse 17, and Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God. Save this stranger. That's still written in red. If you have it in your Bibles, you can see that up on the screen. You don't see that. Jesus said, if it wasn't for this guy, no one, none of them would have came back. And verse 19, the last verse we're going to read, it says, and he said unto them, arise, go that way. Thy faith have made thee whole. Back in verse 17, he says, but where are the nine? Look to your neighbor and ask him, are you one of the nine? I want to hear, are you one of the nine? Surely not, but the odds are against us, aren't they? If we got 10 people on this row, three, six, nine. Abra, if you were moved back. You're, you're, you're the one, aren't you? Think about that. How many people are in here this morning? 200 and 250, maybe 240? Uh, how many, what's the percentage that would have went back and thanked Jesus? Where are the rest of the 200 and what is that? I can't even figure. Ben, you're a numbers guy. Tell me. 24 people would have said, thank you, right? So 216 people, where are they at? Which one are you? Which one am I? The odds are stacked against us according to here. So we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of intentionality to do. We've got a lot of digging in to do to be grateful and to live in a, uh, in a life of appreciation. I want to be that. I know you want to be that. And I know some of you are, but I know some of you ain't either. So we'll go, we'll just talk to all of us, okay? How about that? Jesus asked, where are the other nine? And a lot of times you guys know the way that I do messages. I usually have three or four points that you can write down. Today we're not going to do that. We're going to go. I asked Arlen to do it a little bit different. I actually put each verse on a different slide. I didn't compile any verses. Uh, how many noticed that? Attention to detail. Yeah, all right, very good. <laughs> Someone noticed that. I, I put one single verse on each slide. That way we can go back and read it. And we're just going to go in order. And what I wanted to do this morning is just let the Holy Spirit talk to you. Because there is so many different applications that you can use out of those eight verses. It's incredible. And I trust that the Holy Spirit blesses you the way that he blesses me when I read this. We're just going to read it from the top to the bottom. We're going to look at this story, and I pray that the application may apply to you. We just simply read it. First of all, the verse 11, if you look at that, it, it came to pass that Jesus was traveling through Samaria and through Galilee. Now, when we were over there, you guys have heard me talk, talk about this before. Samaria is a real hole in the wall. It's not really anything that you really, while we were there visiting Samaria, there was actually only one other tourist there. It could have been due to the fact that it was 113 degrees, or it could have been due to the fact there's not really anything to see. Not much to see at Samaria. But what, there were people there, and they're, they're in desperate need. They're, it's just a desolate place. It's a place of rejection. It looks horrible around there. It looks like a third world country. This is where Jesus walked through the middle of. And he also walked through the middle of Galilee. These are two places that it mentions in this scripture that he walked through. Uh, but it's interesting that he ended up in a certain village, and it doesn't say the name of that village. But Galilee is a significant place, too. If you stop and think about it, it was actually the boyhood home of Jesus Christ. 
That's where he grew up. All of the disciples that Jesus chose, all of them but one came from Galilee or in that region of Galilee. 25 out of the 33 miracles that Jesus performed, out of 33, 25 of them were performed in the Galilee region, right around that area. And 19 of his 32 parables. Eli, you'll love this. You love parables. 19 out of 32 parables were spoken in the Galilee region. So Jesus knew his way around Galilee, and he also knew his way around Samaria. This wasn't the first time, and it wasn't the last time that he would go through Samaria. But this, is, this story is telling us that he walked through there. Ultimately, Galilee then becomes the headquarters for Jesus' ministry as we know it today. And he, but here's the deal. He's passing through the middle of these places that, are, that have rejects. Rejects like me. Re you can say it if you finish. Rejects like, okay, I won't say it. None of you are. But he was willing to walk through it. He was willing to go there. And there's some awesome things that happened when he went there. The one thing I love about God is that he loves to visit the places of rejection. He loves to go to those places that I hang out at, that you hang out at. He loves to have those redemptive stories of completeness and wholeness. And we're going to get there with this scripture, just these few verses. It talks about that whole plan if you look at it through the big picture. Jesus is walking through there. And then he goes to a village in verse 12. And he's entered a certain village. And there... Uh, where am I? At? And there he met ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. First of all, you need to understand that these ten lepers, I, I believe that the certain village wasn't named. I think Samaria was uh, important enough or popular enough, and Galilee was popular enough that they were named. But this certain village was a place that I don't think it really had a name. I think it was just a place where people like these ten lepers would hang out. But you need to understand, and I've explained it before, but leprosy back in those days was a, a skin disorder that would change the pigment of your skin. It would change the color of your skin, and eventually it would get sore and eventually your skin would rot and it would fall off. It was very much meant and, and believed to be, uh, I'm sorry, a curse, but it was contagious. Thank you. Yes, it was a curse. But they had obviously done something wrong to gain this type of disease, but it was contagious. And so in that day and in that culture, what they would do with these lepers is they would put them in one place. And they would keep them there and they weren't supposed to be with society. They couldn't be with family. They couldn't be intermingled with each other. It was just they were pushed to the side. How many know that when we have things going on in our lives, how many know we attract the same kind of people? When there's drama going in our lives, a lot of times you'll find people just like you around you. If you're attracting crazy, you better check it out. Interesting here, well, a long time ago, I, I say a long time ago, we, uh, Becky and I opened our house for dinner one evening. It was, it was some, some, some uh, single people, <laughs> no, nothing against single people, but we, we invited all the single people over, and these guys had some issues, and uh, we, we had tried, I wasn't going to say this story. Boy, I got myself in a corner, didn't I? We, we were trying to help these people, and we still do. But uh, that evening, there was a compilation of, I don't know, how many were there, six? They were standing up on the deck, and me and Becky decided, hey, you know, it was just a, it was just a, a informal type of dinner. Hey, come over. We, we, we had no agenda whatsoever. We were going to go out and do yard work, hoping they'd come help. And... Uh, <laughs> She's shrewd, I'm telling you. Um, so we went down in the, in the bottom, and we were burning some trash. And all six of them stood up there on the deck like this, and they were looking down at us. And it's how far? 80 yards from the deck down to the swamp. We were burning the, the undergrowth of our swamp out. And Becky goes, would you just look at that? She said, our house has turned into the Winesburg. What did you call it? Weinsberg mission and I'm like yeah but they all they all attracted to each other 
I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, but, but it is the truth. Misery loves company. And what you produce, what you're saying, the things that you're, your actions attract that very same thing back. And if you're not liking what you're seeing around you, I am very serious when I say you need to either change your ways or change the company you're with if you can, if you can attract the better company. But this is, we laughed about it. We were like Weinsberg Rescue Mission here in Weinsberg. And uh, there they stood. They wouldn't lift a finger to help us, which was fine. We didn't. That was not why we had them there. But it was like we, we it, was, it, was, it was humorous to see. None of them really, I mean, they knew each other, but it was like different walks of life. And so they banded together. These ten had found each other. They had the disease that was very, very prohibitive to be around anyone. They had found each other. They were hanging out in this certain village. And here comes Jesus walking through the middle of it. They all had something in common. They stood on the outskirts of the village. You know, they were scared to get too involved. In verse 12, it says they stood afar off. And I, as you read that very simple line, they stood afar off, it makes me wonder how many of people have something going on in their lives. There's something turmoil in your life. There's drama in your life. There's maybe sin in your life. You come to church, but that's as far as you'll go. That's as far as you want to go. You'll come to church. You'll have a seat. You'll, you'll join in and singing. And then when you leave, that's as far as I ever want to get in my relationship with Jesus. Maybe you don't feel connected. Maybe you don't feel plugged in. You're standing afar off. They found themselves standing afar off. There was 10 of them. But something really, really special was getting ready to happen in this story. In verse 13, it says, they lifted up their voices. I think they saw Jesus coming and they lifted up their voices. They didn't go and they say, Jesus, hey, Jesus. No, it was Jesus, Master have mercy on us. You want to get God's attention? Things going on in your life? You got misery, or drama? I don't know what's going on in your life. I know what's going on in mine. There's days that I just have to say, I just say, Jesus, if you'd be in my store, you guys would freak out because sometimes I'll actually take seven trips out around that retail floor praying because I believe the walls of Jericho come down one day. Amen? Sometimes you just got to cry out to God, not in a, not in a timid way. I think we, we were raised in a very honorable way, in a very uh, restricted way or conservative way, so to speak. But man, sometimes you just got to get loud. And these guys, I think they were sick of the life they were living. I think it was time for them. They were like, we can't handle this anymore. We know that this Thanksgiving, we can't be with our family because we did this, this, and this. Or maybe this Thanksgiving, we, we can't intermingle with the people. And you know what? I'm sick and tired of my skin falling off. Man, when you get to the end of something that is miserable in your life, you will cry out to Jesus. Amen? How many have done that? How many? It's not an altar call. But how many? Don't raise your hand. But how many need to do that today? How many need to cry out to Jesus today? There's something going on in your life. And you can't quite get it. He's right there. And you're standing at a far off. They raised their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. I think it's interesting that they didn't say Muhammad and they didn't say Buddha. And I, you know what? I am always willing to meet with anyone that has an issue. But they didn't say, Pastor Jimmy, have mercy on us. Some of us just need to cry out to Jesus. Just cry out to Jesus. Just look to Jesus. What does he say? You want out of your situation? Cry out to Jesus. Interesting enough, the very next word that they used when they addressed Jesus was master. Everybody say master. master. What is a master? Someone who is in charge. If the master tells me to go cook chili at the chili cook-off, thank you, Harold, we will go cook chili, won't we? Yeah. If he tells me to go whatever the master tells me to do, we will do. He is Lord over those under him. And when he speaks, 
we obey. I think it's interesting that these people in their desperation, in the situation that where they were in, in the sickness that they had, sick and tired of being that way, they say, hey, Jesus, they recognized who he was, but then they also recognized, and he heard it when they said, Master, they vocalize master. And when you say Jesus, master, that means, you know what? Whatever you get ready to say next, the next thing that comes out of your mouth, I am willing to go do. When we recognize him as master, because he's in control, not us. And he's asking us to do some things and we don't want to. We understand, we, we recognize Jesus as our savior. Oh yeah. We sure don't want to go to hell, but not as our master because we're not willing to sell it all out and go after and be obedient to the point that a master would ask us to be. And then they said, have mercy on us. What is mercy? Mercy is simply something that God gives us that we do not deserve. And whether you know it or not, mercy is what got you up this morning. And whether you know it or not, mercy is what kept you on your side of the road and them on their side of the road. How many had a close call this morning? Anybody? That was mercy. Mercy is what allowed me to put my clothes on this morning. And here are these 10. They're asking for mercy. They want mercy. In verse 14, it says this, and when he saw them. We're going to take this line by line, guys. When he saw them. See, when he saw them was after the fact that they had called out to him. Jesus is walking right here. He's here today. He's walking through the midst of all of our rejection, all of us that are rejected, all of us that have problems, all of us that have issues. Jesus is walking right here. But he may not come to you until you call to him. And they were were willing to call to him. And it says, when he saw them. It doesn't matter how low you are. It doesn't matter how bad your marriage is. It doesn't matter how deep in debt you are. It doesn't matter. When you call out to Jesus, he will be there. doesn't matter how bad the addiction is. He will see you. Verse 14 says, he said unto them, go show yourselves to the priest. It's a simple instruction. Where were the priests hanging out? Anybody? Modern day. Where do you think the priests are? Temple or church. Go to church. That's a simple command. Go to church. Start going to church. I had to put that in there. We're glad you're here this morning. But it's important to understand why Jesus said to go to the priest. See, the priests were the only ones in that culture that could validate the healing that that was happened. But these 10 lepers were supposedly by culture to be healed before they show up at the priest. They're not supposed to show up to the priest with leprosy all over them. Again, they are cut off from society. They need a miracle in their lives. They need to be healed completely. But Jesus, his his simple statement, his simple instruction was, go to the priest and show yourselves. He knew they were going to do it because they had already called out master, willing to obey. But they weren't supposed to go to the priest until they got healed. Sometimes I, I, I get this question a lot. What am, I don't know what God has for me. I don't know what his purpose, my purpose is in life, or what his purpose is for me in life. Just follow God. My sheep know my voice. Start calling out to God and start believing that the things that you're hearing are from God and know that you know that you know it's in here. You can feel it when it's right and you can feel it when Jesus is, is answering you, just obey. And by the time you get to where you're going, you're going to be okay. I know not everything's good in my life. I'm thankful for everything that I have, but not everything is great in Jimmy Math's life. 
But I know that if I keep obeying God and I keep putting one foot in front of the other and I keep my ear to the Bible and my ear to the ground, I know that I will be okay when I get to wherever I'm going and I'm all right with it. I don't want to be like everybody else. I want to be like me. And God has a plan for me. And I know that. He has a plan for you. And you need to know that. And you need to be okay with it. Just start following. Start going where he tells you to go. And by the time you get there, you will be healed. That's a comfort for me. I might not be healed right now. It might not be right right now. I might not have it all together right now. But by the time I get there, I will. Amen? How many received that this morning? Do what he tells you to do. Start obeying him now. In verse 15, uh, or no, in verse 14, it says, And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Verse 15, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. How many can see that? Ten of them. They all got the same healing. They're walking to the priest. And I believe, I don't think they messed around. I don't think it was a delay in their leaving. I think when he said, go to the priest and show yourself, I think they were so sick and tired of the life that they had been given or cursed with or whatever you, however you want to say that. I think they ran. And on the way, they're doing like this. Look at this. And the first ones were probably going, hey, look, it's going away. And by the time it got to the 10th one, he's like, Oh, whoa, 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 wait, I got to go back and I got to be grateful for what God has done for me. See, what's interesting to me is all of them got the same thing. All of us sitting here today have virtually the same things in life. We all have homes. We all have food. We all have clothes, blessings of earthly things. We all have these things. How many of you are thankful for the miracle that God has performed in your life? And I know there's people that small miracles happen all the time and you forget. I do. I, I sometimes forget. As big as a miracle as Becky's health, sometimes I forget. I made a promise I'd never argue with her and I've held that up. Okay, I have. We forget. We're human. He's asking us to remember, to thank him. We so often have time for God when things aren't good. When our marriage is bad, we have time to pray. When our finances are down, we have time to go to church and we have time to pray. When there's pain in our lives, we have time for God. When we didn't have a job, we have time. But once we get what we've asked for, how many of us forget to thank God? We just don't have the time to go to church anymore. Now that he's blessed us with this business, we just can't. We don't have time anymore. Now that he's blessed us with, with our marriage is good. We've we got to go on vacation. We just don't have time for God anymore. But this man, in verse 15, he came back. And with a loud voice, he glorified God. I know there's times in Scripture tells us to be silent, and be still and know that I am God. I know that's, those are verses as well. But I don't think that this glorifying God was anything like that. I think he had a huge praise for God. Do we have huge praise for God? I think it was so meaningful to this man that he finally got healed. He couldn't be quiet. In verse 16, it says, He fell down on his face at Jesus' feet, at his feet, giving Jesus thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And I've told you before that the Samaritan people were just not a very high in culture. They weren't high in stat stature as far as, uh, or status quo. They, they, they were lower than... Uh, they were mixed. They were sort of like a, a mixture of, of Jews and Gentiles together. And, and it was just sort of a, a, bad, a bad mix of people. He opened his mouth and praised him. 
or the other nine? And which one are you? Which category do you fall into? Or is it just Sundays that you thank God, but at least you do it just Sundays. That's 52 out of a year, not just on Thursday, Thanksgiving, whatever date that is. Which category do you fall Do you give God the praise that he deserves? Verse 17, Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. This is the only guy that came back. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Kurt, if you'll bring your team up. All the others got the same healing. Only one, only one was made whole. They were healed. They felt good. They could go back to their families. They could intermingle with anyone they wanted to. There was no boundaries around them. Everything was great, but only one was made whole. You want to be made whole? Do you want to get the most out of your life? Do you want to get everything out of your life that God has planned for you? Then start giving him thanks and start giving him praise. Praise him for the smallest things. Praise him for everything that you can think of. And what that does is it'll, where Paul says to be continually in prayer, that's what that does. It puts you in a continual prayer mode because when I say thank you, Lord, for that parking spot or thank you, Lord, for this drink of water, when I say that, I am praying to God. And when I live my life that way, my language changes. The language of appreciation or the language of thanksgiving, the language of being thankful sounds different. And here's how you'll know which category that you fall into. In Deuteronomy, where God was given the children of Israel the lands, he said, I will give you all of the vineyards. I will give you all of these things. And all of the land was be, going to be given to him. But here's one command that I give you. Don't forget who gave it to you. And it's the same today. He's given us all this stuff. He's given us these great lives. And yet we forget who gave it to us. And here's how you know which category you fall into. How many have caught yourself saying, oh, I have to go to work Monday morning. Or, oh, I have to make dinner. Or in my situation, it's, I have to clean up after Becky again. <laughs> Y'all know the truth, don't you? She gets to clean up after me. I've done it. I'm guilty. I'm not saying I'm not. But when we start living a thankful life, our language starts to change. See, I am so blessed. God has blessed me. I can go pick my kids up. I get to do that. God has blessed me with a beautiful home, and guess what? I get to clean it. God has blessed me with a business, and guess what? I get to go to work. That's the one, not the nine. Which side are you on? God has blessed us with 84 kids showing up at Awana, and I get to go teach them. That's amazing opportunity that I am so thankful for. What are you thankful for this morning? Out of everything that God has given us, most thankful for his son who came and gave everything. He gave his life and taught me the language of thankfulness. It's a lifestyle.
there's going to be challenges. It's not always easy. If you'll stand, this isn't always easy. But my challenge to you is don't just do it today. Don't just do it Thursday. Live this Thanksgiving language and life out. Make it be who you are. There's nothing more attractive than people who are thankful. Imagine us all going out and being thankful for the small things, from the parking spots to the bank accounts to whatever you're thankful for. Just be thankful. Be grateful and tell everyone that you meet that you're thankful. Yeah, you might not be healed, but you're on your way. And on our way, we give thanks. The happiest people I know are the people that are thankful for the things they have in the now. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this opportunity. To study your word, it's a simple passage, and yet it's loaded with so many applications for our lives here on this earth. And Lord, I thank you for those 10 lepers. I thank you for healing them. And I am grateful for the nine that didn't come back and say thank you. I will thank you for them. (laughs) You deserve a lot of praise. You deserve all the glory. You deserve all the honor in everything that we do. And so God, as we walk through this life, as you're taking us to our final destination, wherever that may be as far as in life, we know that it's heaven, but we want to know We we would like things to be okay now, and maybe they're not. And so, God, as we walk through that, we're thankful for the little things. We're thankful for the lessons that you teach us. And we'll give you all the honor and glory for everything that that you do in this church. We're thankful for everyone who showed up here this morning. Bless them in a major way this Thanksgiving season and for all seasons to come. We love you and we praise you. Jesus' name and the church said.